Dr. Magda Havis is an associate professor from Trent University in Peterborough, where she's been teaching a unique course uh, for the past 15 years called The Biological Effects of Electromagnetic Fields. At Trent, she also conducted research on health effects on environmental contaminants. Dr. Havis received her PhD from the University of Toronto in 1980, where she did research on chemical pollution, especially acid rain. After completing her PhD, she went on to Cornell to do postdoctoral research. Her acid rain studies were conducted in New Hampshire, in Ontario, near the Sudbury Smelters, uh, in the Canadian Arctic at a place called Smoking Hills. The Smoking Hills is one of the most acidic acid environments in the world. By studying this natural acid, we can learn a lot about the industrial sources and their effects in an ecosystem. Here, Magda is monitoring her experiment in one of the acidic ponds. In the 1980s, acid rain was a hot political topic. For those of you who can't read it, sir, you have Brian Mulrooney on the left-hand side saying, Sir, all Canadians pray for a solution to the acid rain problem. Uh, you, you actually have Ronald Reagan on the right-hand side. Well, gosh, Brian, tell them that Nancy and I join him in their prayers. <laughs> there was limited general knowledge among population, just as there is now about radio frequency radiation. The naysayers were active, acid rain, headliner hoax. Dr. Havis responded by writing Red Herrings and Acid Rain Research, which countered the misleading information and eventually put the naysayers to rest. Eventually, acid rain was acknowledged as being a serious environmental threat. Well, we could suppose there could be just a, a teensy, bean, teensy tiny bit of substance to that acid rain hoopla. Steps were taken to bring the amendments to the Clean Air Act both in Canada and the United States which resulted in significant improvements in air quality. Shortly after, Dr. Havis turned her attention to electrosmog. Her research includes effects on extremely low frequency electromagnetic fields, dirty electricity, ground current, and radio frequency radiation. Since 1980, Dr. Havis has, been, has given more than 265 public lectures in 24 countries and at 24 universities. She's also given advice to non-government groups around the world, including the International Association of Firefighters. Dr. Dr. Havis provides expert testimony, and she is currently an expert witness in front of the Superior Court of Quebec regarding a cellular tower. Today, she's going to address the issue we face locally, the antennas on the Bell on the Bronte Fire Station. The title of her talk is, Cell Phone Towers, Are They Safe? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Magda Havis. Um, the reason we're all here is that uh, Bell has placed antennas on a tower, but it's not any kind of tower. It's actually special. It's very close to a fire hall. And this is something that I feel very strongly about uh, because I was involved in some of the um, policies that the firefighters have set up to protect themselves against this form of radiation. In 2004, in Boston, the International Association of Firefighters got together and they passed a resolution. That resolution uh, stated the following. Bob? The IAFF opposed the use of fire stations as base stations for towers and or antennas for the conduction of cell phone transmissions until a study with the highest scientific merit and integrity on health effects of exposure to low intensity radio frequency microwave radiation is conducted and is proven that such sightings are not hazardous to the health of our members. Now, you might be interested in knowing the reason for this resolution. By the way, we worked on this for about two years before it came in front of the firefighters in 2004. So for the past 10 years, um, a small group of very dedicated individuals have been very concerned about this and wanting to protect uh, our first responders. The reason for this is that um, there was a cell tower placed on a, on a fire hall in um, California. And within five years, some of the firefighters were uh, having symptoms of poor health. And these were the symptoms that they complained about. 
confusion, short-term memory loss, inability to focus, migraine headaches, slowed reaction time, insomnia, brain fog, infertility, depression, tremors, and vertigo. Now you can just imagine how difficult it is to be a firefighter if you're experiencing vertigo and you're having difficult, difficulty making decisions on the spot. The firefighters went through some very extensive medical testing, and Dr. Gunnar Hauser at, uh, in California did something called a SPEC brain scan. And he found that of the six firefighters who volunteered to have their brain scans, five of them showed abnormal, be, um, abnormal activity that didn't correspond to chemical toxicants that they're also exposed to. And the only person, the only firefighter um, who did not show these symptoms was the fire chief who was uh, serving as fire chief at two different halls. So he was only spending half of his time at this particular fire uh, station. In order for us to be able to have a conversation about this, I think it's really important to understand some key concepts and terms. And this is something I teach at Trent University. So I'm just going to introduce you to some of the concepts that uh, I share with my students as well. And this is called Antennas 101. This is called uh, a cellular base station, and it consists of tower that holds the antennas. In Europe, they call it a mast, so that's how you might be able to see it in the literature. It has, this particular one has quite a few antennas on it, uh, and it's in Toronto, by the way. The third part uh, of one of these cellular base stations is the cabin that contains the electrical supply. Now, these antennas look very different, and they have different functions. The ones at the top are omnidirectional, which means they radiate in all directions. And one of the ways that you can think about them is like an incandescent light bulb that simply gives light in all directions. We have some that are point-to-point -point antennas. And here you can imagine a laser where you beam the laser to another antenna that picks up the signal. And the third type of antenna we have here is called a sector antenna, which simply radiates in a certain direction. And uh, one of the ways to think of a sector antenna is like a flashlight. So when you beam a flashlight in a direction, the light doesn't go everywhere. Now let's take a look at the antenna on the uh, uh, Bronte Fire Hall. Here you can see that there are three antennas um, that are point to point. If we move up, we have some sector antennas. These are the 2G and 4G antennas. And then we have something called a, a 4G antenna. You can see here that they're much broader uh, than the 2G um, and 3G antennas. Now, what does 4G mean? It actually means fourth generation, whereas 2G and 3G refer to third generation. These antennas have different carrier frequencies. Here we can see the 2,000... Um, 2,600 megahertz for the 4G antenna. And you can simply think of these, they're carrier frequencies, they're carrying information. And so you can think of them almost as vehicles or trains or buses or something. And this is the cargo that they're carrying. In some cases, uh, it's movies uh, or data, uh, internet access, text, voice. Um, so this is what the information is that they're carrying. And now we have an example of how these antennas should work. This is a sector antenna, and ideally, this is the type of radiation you should get from it. In reality, however, these antennas have something called a side lobe, which means that some of the radiation is going to be in, uh, given off in a direction that they really don't want it to go. And if we look at the uh, radiation pattern, we can see here um, that uh, you have very high levels of radiation at a distance of about 200 meters with this particular kind of configuration, but you also have very high levels immediately beneath the antenna. Now, some antenna providers will tell you the safest place you could be when it comes to an antenna is immediately underneath it. So when people are complaining that they don't want an antenna on their apartment building, um, then... Um, uh, what the cell phone provider will tell you is, well, if we put it on your neighbors, you're going to get more of the radiation. And so you can see here that this is one of the reasons it's particularly important not to have firefighters' uh, antennas on fire halls. 
Many of the fire halls, although not the one here, have a flat roof, and the firefighters go on that flat roof to do some of their drills. They also have something called a hose tower. So they, they take the hose up there after they've used it and allow it to dry. So they actually get very close to some of the antennas that are immediately on or um, near their buildings. So this is another reason why um, that is not an ideal place to put them. Now, the resolution, the uh, Resolution 15, it's called, that was passed by the International Association of Firefighters, was passed back in 2004 with 80% of the vote, 80% of the support from the firefighters. Unfortunately, what's happening is some of the firefighters, uh, some of the union members, don't know that this has been passed, and so they don't realize that there are potential harmful health effects associated with this. What I'd like to do now is share with you some of the science uh, since that time, some very recent studies uh, that have been done that are basically showing that this form of radiation is not safe. In May of this year, uh, or last year, the World Health Organization classified radiofrequency radiation as a class 2B carcinogen. This means possibly carcinogenic. And to the, to the lay audience, this sounds like a very wishy-washy kind of uh, designation. But to be, for something to be possibly carcinogenic is actually a very powerful statement. And you must recognize that some of the statements, some of the policies that we have are based on science, uh, but they're influenced by our view of the world, and they're influenced by policy uh, from other countries, and they're influenced by money as well. So there's a heck of a lot of lobbying going on whenever a guideline or a standard is passed because the industry doesn't want the levels to come down. They want to be allowed to uh, radiate as much as they want. Now, in this, uh, at this um, conference that was held, there were two Canadian scientists who voted on this. One happened to be with Health Canada. So Health Canada is aware of this information. And according to the people who did the study, uh, who came up with the classification, they said they based their, um, most of their uh, information on the Interphone study, which was a very important study that I'll mention, as well as studies with laboratory uh, animals. In this news release, this is one of the statements, four of six studies showed increased cancer incidence after exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic fields in combination with known carcinogens. Now this becomes particularly important when we're dealing with firefighters. No matter how much care they take to protect themselves when they rush into a burning building, they are exposed to many more atmospheric carcinogens than you and I are. And if you look at the statistics, the health statistics for firefighters, um, they have much higher cancer rates than does the general population. So we really don't want them to be the rats in the experiment where they're exposed to carcinogens from chemicals and then they're irradiated in the um, um, fire halls that they stay at. Here we have a short video about um, the decision that was made by the World Health Organization, and we need a little bit of volume on this. Good evening, bonsoir, and welcome to the virtual press conference of the International Agency for Research on Cancer. My name is Nicolas Godin, and I'm the head of communications for IARC. Here in Lyon, the uh, working group has been meeting to assess the carcinogenic hazards associated with exposure to radio frequency electromagnetic fields and has just finished the evaluations. I'm pleased to have with me here in the IAC studios Dr. Jonathan Samet. Thank you. And I'll hand over to Dr. John Samet. Thank you and uh, good evening. I'm going to briefly summarize uh, the work of a group of 31 uh, international scientists carried out over the uh, last uh, eight days here in uh, Lyon. I think uh, quickly to move to the, the bottom line after reviewing uh, essentially all the evidence uh, that is relevant to looking at radio frequency electromagnetic uh, fields, the uh, working group uh, classified radio frequency electromagnetic fields as possibly carcinogenic to humans that is within the classification used by the um, International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, a 
2B classification. The working group reached this uh, classification based on its review of the human evidence coming from epidemiological studies showing an increased risk for glioma, a malignant type of brain cancer in association with uh, wireless phone use. The uh, working group was multidisciplinary and also looked carefully at animal studies in which uh, animals had been exposed to uh, radiation from mobile phones or similar types of radiation. There, there was uh, evidence, limited evidence of an association of cancer risk with that exposure. We also uh, carefully considered uh, the sources of exposure of populations to uh, radio frequency electromagnetic fields, the nature of the, these fields as they come from various uh, devices, including uh, wireless phones. Uh, so I think with that um, summary, I'll uh, turn things back to uh, you and your questions. Thank you, Dr. Sennett. Uh, next, Jeff Waters from Australian Broadcasting. Good morning. Thank you for taking the question. Um, the, uh, there hasn't been any mention so far, as far as I've heard, and please correct me if I'm wrong, of uh, telephone towers, mobile telephone towers, and their effects on human health. Um, uh, given what you've served, the classification that you've given uh, this, uh, d d should we conclude that mobile telephone towers are also included in the possible risk? The designation uh, of for two, group 2B is radio frequency electromagnetic fields that is unspecified as to source. So the group 2B classification would have broad applicability to sources with this type of emissions. Okay, the reason we're told not to hold the cell phone next to our head is because it's constantly emitting microwave radiation. And as you move it away, you can see the level goes down. And this is what microwave radio frequency radiation sounds like coming from a cell phone antenna. This is a long-term care facility. And on the grounds, we have a cell phone antenna disguised as a flagpole. Here we have more than 5,000 microwatts per meter squared. If you live within a few hundred meters of these cell phone antennas, you are exposed to constant microwave radio frequency radiation. And this is 11,000 microwatts per meter squared. We did that last filming um, in November of last year, 2011, and the readings that we got were between 5,000 and 11,000 microwatts per centimeter squared, sorry, per meter squared. Um, and I've got Rob Metzinger here, who's going to do some demonstrations. Most people recognize that it's, it's harmful to hold a cell phone to your head, and they will say, but the towers are perfectly safe. So what we're going to do is, while he sets up, is that we're actually going to measure how close you have to get to the cell phone to get levels between 5 and 11,000 microwatts per meter squared. So he's got a cell phone. And he's going to make a call. So what are the levels that you're getting for that radiation? It's a distance of about an inch, uh, about an inch we're getting readings of about 10,000 microwatts per square meter. Okay, so one inch from a cell phone, we're getting the same readings that we were getting across the street uh, from these cell towers. So if that much radiation is harmful if you hold it to your head, how harmful it is, is it when you're exposing your entire body to it? Most people are concerned about antennas, but they don't realize that there are a lot of devices in your home that also emit microwave radiation, and they emit it constantly. And what Rob is doing here, he's selecting, is it a baby monitor? 
Okay, here we have a baby monitor. Do you want to move even further away? At this point, we're reading about 11,000 or 10,000 microwatts per square meter. Baby monitors, uh, to put an infant next to a baby monitor is probably the worst thing that you can do. In Europe, they have voice-activated baby monitors, which means they're not radiating until the infant cries or makes a sound. Here, we're basically microwaving infants. We're also microwaving the parent who has the other part of the monitor on a hip um, or, or near them. The next thing we're going to show is a cordless phone. That's a similar sound to the, the baby monitor. It's using deck technology as well, I believe. And uh, at about this distance, we're getting 10 to 11,000 microwatts per square meter as well. And you can, you can hear that, they, that each source has its own distinct uh, audio pattern. So that helps us identify what the sources are uh, with this measuring equipment. Okay, so we're concerned about a tower that's several hundred meters away, yet we have these devices and we might even have them in our bedroom uh, irradiating us all night long. Once again in Europe, and I think you can buy them here as well, uh, there are cordless phones that are on demand, which means they don't radiate. Here the base is radiating whether you're using that phone or not. Uh, in Europe, uh, they have phones that are on demand, which means it's not until you pick up the receiver to make a call that you're exposed to the radiation. So when it comes to cell phones versus a cordless phone, a cordless phone in your home is actually much more dangerous. Okay, the, uh, the next item is a, is a wireless router. This is a pretty beefed up little unit, but the uh, same thing goes for, for a home router. This is a signal pattern we typically hear when we measure wireless internet routers. And again, at a distance of about 18 inches or so, uh, we're getting 10,000 microwatts per square meter. So it's not just what's coming from outside, it's what we're generating inside on our own as well. So it's all concerning. Thank you very much, Rob. This is Rob Metzinger, and he has a company called Safe Living Technologies. And one of the things he does is um, he sells meters and things. We're not here to sell you anything, uh, but if you want to have someone come into your home and do measurements, there all are qualified people who will do that for you. The whole purpose of this uh, demonstration is to show you that, that we're exposed to this radiation all the time. We're exposed at home, at school, uh, at work, and we simply don't want to be exposed to yet another source. And my recommendation to all of you is that if you have these wireless technologies at home, that you really strongly consider replacing them with wire technology, especially if you have infants in your home and especially if you have anyone in your home who suffered from cancer, because we think that this radiation promotes the growth of cancer. We will now move on. Um, one of the studies that uh, the World Health Organization used uh, to convince them that there was a problem was the Interphone study. And the Interphone study looked at the effect of cell phones on brain tumors. This was probably, it is, the largest study that's ever been done. It took more than 10 years, more than $25 million. It included 50 researchers from 13 countries, and Canada was one of the countries that participated in the Interphone study. In 2011, just last year, they published their second report, uh, and this was based on just five countries that participated, and you can see Canada is a among them. And they looked at two different types of brain tumors. One was a glioma that you can see here. The other was uh, a meningioma. And there's a difference between the two of them. This glioma is a tumor of the brain, the actual gray matter of the brain. The meningioma, the meninges, is the lining of the brain. So you can see that these tumors are really quite different uh, in, in their morphology. What this study showed is that after 10 years of exposure, so people who had used a cell phone for more than 10 years, and these were moderate to heavy users at the time, uh, they had a 180% increased risk of developing a glioma. 
In Canada, when they compared the study, the different countries, Canada had the highest rate at 248% increase. We don't know why that is, uh, but we're not faring very well in Canada. And Health Canada is aware of this information because some of their scientists actually did the research. We found that for meningiomas, after seven years, there was a 100% increase. But for meningiomas, the results aren't that consistent. For gliomas, we're pretty, cons we're pretty certain that there is a direct causal relationship between people developing a glioma brain tumor. The other type of study that the World Health Organization based their results on was cancer studies with um, laboratory animals. And this is looking at long-term, low-level exposure uh, to microwave radiation. And when I use the term low-level exposure, I'm referring to levels that are below our federal guidelines. So these are, gu these are levels that Canada allows all of us to be exposed to. Although this study was completed in 1984, uh, it was done by the U.S. Air Force, and once again, it was a very expensive study, exceptionally well conducted. It wasn't until 1992 that they published the results, so they sat on them for a very long time. And it wasn't until 2005 that it became available uh, on the Internet. And what did their study actually do? Well, they, they took rats and exposed them to two 1,450 megahertz. Remember, this is the carrier frequency. And if we compare them to the 2G, 3G, and the 4G networks, we're talking about a frequency that's intermediate. This 2.4 gigahertz, which is another way that we refer to it, uh, is the same frequency that's used by your microwave oven to heat your food. It's the same frequency that's used for Wi-Fi. It's the same frequency that's used for certain types of cordless phones. So this is a very common exposure. The intensity was below the guidelines, and the duration was for about 25 months. These are the results that they got. They looked at various organs and the lesions within those organs. They then uh, looked at three different types of cancers, or tumors, pardon me. They looked at benign tumors, primary tumors, and metastatic tumor. And a metastatic tumor is a tumor that migrates from one type of tissue into another tissue. These are their results, and I'm going to summarize them for you. What are the effects of long-term exposure to low levels of pulsed 2,450 megahertz microwave radiation? Well, they found that for the rats that were exposed, as opposed to those that were not exposed, there was a 16% increase in benign tumors, a 100% increase in metastatic tumors, and 260% increase in primary tumors. Now, this is very disturbing information, and that's probably one of the reasons they didn't release it right away. So we have evidence that cell phones uh, contribute to cancer. We have rat studies that contribute to cancer. But we're really here to talk about cellular antennas. So what's the evidence uh, here related to cancer? The most recent study looking at people who lived at different distances from cell phone antennas is a study that was conducted in Brazil. Uh, the city was Belo Horizonte, which means beautiful horizon. This is the third largest city in Brazil, has a population about the size of Toronto, a really very modern city. This study was funded by uh, the Brazilian government, and I'd like to share with you just one of the results, one of the um, uh, graphs that they had in the study. What we have here along the x-axis is the distance from base stations. And what we have along the right axis is the rate of mortality per 100,000 people. Now, so here we've got closer to the base station, here we have further away. This is the normal rate of mortality um, in the population. And so if the towers don't have any effect, this is the rate that you would expect, irrespective uh, of where you were. And this is what they found. So within about 600 meters, there was uh, an increase in cancer mortality rate. And you can see the closer you get, the higher that mortality rate is. The maximum exposure in the study was 41 microwatts per centimeter squared. Now, the units I'm using here are different than the ones we used here, so I don't want to confuse you. I'll be using these units from now on. 
How does that 41 microwatts per centimeter squared compare to Canada's Safety Code 6 guideline? This is a safety code guideline that's made by Health Canada and enforced by Industry Canada. We're allowed to be exposed to 1,000 microwatts per centimeter squared. Yet the highest they measured here in this study was 41, and this is what it was associated with, an increased cancer rate. By the way, our guidelines are for a six-minute uh, exposure. This is the average uh, during a six-minute period. So there's nothing. We have no guidelines that protect us against 24 hours a day exposure, although Health Canada will say this guideline works for that as well. In addition to the Brazilian study, there was a study done in Israel, and there was a study done in Germany. And in all of these cases, you can see that the uh, cancer rate increased at fairly low levels. In addition to cancer, we're really concerned about something called electro-hypersensitivity. And this is a study that was done in Spain back in 2002. And you can see here, along this axis, we have distance from cell towers. And here is within 10 meters, and the black shows you within beyond 300 meters. The taller the bar, uh, the larger the number of respondents who had symptoms very often. And the symptoms in order that they occurred here are shown here. Frequency, sleep disturbance, headaches, feelings of discomfort. If you look at that list, these are the recurring symptoms that we have in a number of other studies as well. And collectively, they've been referred to as electro-hypersensitivity. So we have the Santini study in Spain. We have another study, Spain revisited. This time they actually measured the levels. And look at what we have here, 0.1 microwatts was the average for the people who were exposed. Remember, our guidelines are 1,000. A study in Poland, you can see the symptoms. A study in Austria, in Egypt. And here, the highest was just above 50 microwatts per centimeter squared. So the critical uh, levels, 300 meters, are very similar to the levels that we experience for cancer. And you can see here that the exposures are much, much lower than Health Canada's Safety Code 6 guideline of 1,000 microwatts per centimeter squared. Now here we have um, our own case at home. This is in Toronto. And one of the cell phone providers, I won't name them, place these antennas on top of this apartment building. Now there's a man standing here that you might be able to see. They made a real mistake with this, because remember, these antennas, although they're supposed to be radiating outward, they have side lobes. And so people who stand close to the antenna are exposed to this radiation. And we have a short video clip here to show you. This is one woman's experience of living on the top floor under cell antennas for two months. Um, it started with my daughter. She initially got a rash on her leg that was sort of unexplainable. And when she was trying to explain to me what it felt like, she kept saying it was kind of funny because it wasn't hurting inside or on the skin. She said it was hurting in the skin. And uh, then a few days later, she got another rash on her arm and then another small kind of stranger rash and it was the same thing and then one day in the kitchen she was holding something and she dropped it because she said it felt like the blood in her hand went cold and in a wave along her hand to her fingertips and then her hand stayed about stayed numb for about 15 minutes some more of the symptoms include a, a sort of hissing in my ear um, in particular when I'm in my apartment but for about three days anywhere I went it would just sort of come in I kind of felt like an antenna and I'd sort of kind of go like trying to find the place where the, the hissing or the buzzing stopped. Um, I've not slept in my apartment since last Saturday, um, so a week ago now, and the buzzing went away after about three days, and also the feeling of um, tingling all over my body slowly started to go away, but I have noticed that whenever I'm in other buildings now or anywhere close to, I don't even know what, because I was never sensitive before, I'm, I'm no Luddite, I have, you know, I have computers, I have all the stuff that, that you know, most of us have, and I've never been sensitive at all. But now, when, wherever I go, I'm feeling the same as I felt in my apartment, feeling dizzy and nauseous and a sort of a metallic taste in my mouth, um, headache and pressure on my head, and just feeling like I want to sort of faint or, or throw up. And that's wherever I go now. So I found myself becoming increasingly sensitive to my own, you know, my own computer and my own cell phone in ways that I never was before. 
And we're very fortunate to have Veronica here with us tonight, and she agreed to come and, and share her story with you. So I'm going to invite you, uh, Veronica. Thank you. Um, that was really on, very early on in my experience, so I look at that now and I think I wish it had stayed that way. Um, but to start from the beginning, um, in November of 2009, when a big truck pulled up outside of my building and started unloading um, all of the components to put up 25 cell antennas on my rooftop right above my, my balcony, um, I called my landlord and I asked him what was happening and he told me that it was cell towers and that they were going up all over the city and that they were safe and I believed him. And then two weeks later, when the noise on top of my roof was just a little too loud for me to ignore because I'm on the top floor, and it felt like massive tons of things kept falling on, on uh, just above my ceiling, I went upstairs and I spoke to the person who seemed to be in charge, and he kind of pointed out in the city and showed me other places where there were cell towers, which are far fewer than there are now, and basically told me that I had nothing to worry about and that they were safe, and I believed him. And there were towers, as you see, saw in those pictures, one of those was up at this point, and it was right at the edge of the balcony. And I let him know that I lived right below where this tower was, and he assured me that they were safe, and I believed him. And so two weeks later, when my ears started to buzz, um, really loud pitched, particularly at night when I was lying in my bed, unbeknownst to me that directly above my bed was a slab of concrete with a cell tower on it. Um, I believe that I had tinnitus and it's what happens when you get a little older and I didn't make a connection at all. And then over the next two months when I started to lose my memory, have headaches that lasted two weeks long when I didn't have headaches at all before, um, nausea, dizzy spells, memory loss. And when they say short-term memory loss, as I grew to discover over the next year, short-term memory loss became trying to spell the word house, saying H-O-U, and can't find the letter S. I've never experienced that again since then, but, but that's when they say short-term memory loss, it wasn't a joke. It came and it went. Um, the tingling sensations that I had when I tried to sleep at night, that slowly were present everywhere that I went. Uh, the heart palpitations that came when I was anywhere close to a computer, that eventually came when I was anywhere close to a Wi-Fi antenna. Um, and what was I to believe at that point other than what my body was telling me? Um, at some point really on, really early on, thank goodness, I was given some really good advice, and a piece of that advice was to call Magda Havis, who showed up at my house which is something she does very rarely. But knowing that I lived in a top floor apartment, I think it was something she was expecting to hear about uh, sooner or later. And I think when Magda walked into my home, it was the closest she'd been to a live cell tower at that point in her career. And there should really have been a, a sign on my door that said, do not enter. But over the next few months, what started to happen, I spoke to every government agency you could think of, including Health Canada and including Industry Canada, and every single one of them told me that they, that they were safe. Um, by then, I'd stopped believing them, and I'd started to believe what was happening to my body. Um, I, after four days of finding out just how serious the cell towers were, which I didn't really start to investigate until what happened to my daughter happened. That's when I really took it seriously. I wasn't afraid of the towers when they went up there. I didn't know as much as you guys get to know in here today. The kind of information that we have access to now was nothing close to what there is today, which would make it very, very easy for me to make a decision. But at that time, there wasn't a lot of information available, so I didn't really start to suspect those towers until what happened to what some of the stuff that was happening to myself started to happen to my daughter. She stopped sleeping at night and started coming into my bedroom at 1.30 in the morning because she couldn't sleep for the rest of the night. She started getting headaches and feeling nausea, but it was really the experience she had in the kitchen that made her drop what she was doing because of this experience that she was having in her hand. And I said to myself, okay, I don't know what's going on, but I had a feeling it had something to do with the towers. And that's when my real research began. And that's when I found every single symptom, all 16 of those symptoms that were on the list a moment ago, I had, if not right in the beginning, over a period of the next year to a year and a half, I had every single one of those symptoms and some. Um, that's when I started to do the research, and that's when I found the connections between what I was experiencing and what was on my rooftop. To this day, I'm still being told that those towers are safe, and I'm... I'm it's really frustrating to continue to read uh, newspaper articles that try to make 
the idea of electro hypersensitivity sound like we're crazy people or that we're using her med, we're losing our minds, we need psychiatric help or we need stress medication. Um, the, the exactness of the experience is such that I could be in a room and I could tell you there's a microwave oven on somewhere. And we would listen, and over, in, in three minutes, there would be a ding that said a microwave just stopped running. It would either be upstairs, downstairs, or the room beside me, and we could always figure it out. I remember sitting in someone's home who I knew had no technology in her house, sat at a, a chair in her dining room, and then said, do you have a cordless phone in here? Because there are very different sensations for the different technologies. And I, putting myself out there, very early on I decided I wasn't going to run out of the city. I had to make it work wherever I lived. I did have to abandon my home. I lived in a basement apartment for most of a year for two reasons. One, in order to try and reverse some of the symptoms, and two, because it became incredibly difficult to find a home where if you're not exposed to cell towers in the neighborhood, you're exposed to the technology from your neighbors on either side or upstairs or downstairs, all of which I could feel from the wall, through the walls, and I could generally tell you exactly what I was feeling. So when sitting in her home and I said, you don't have a cordless phone in here because I'm feeling a cordless phone. And she said, oh, sorry, sorry, so you shouldn't hear. sit here. That's where the neighbor's cordless phone is. It's right here by the wall. I should have put you down the other end of the table. That's when my daughter decided that I was maybe something from out of space. She'd witnessed enough, but that one for her was really clear that I wasn't making this up, that I could feel things that I shouldn't be able to feel, or actually maybe as human beings we are supposed to feel these things. Um, I could tell you when there was someone standing behind me with a telephone. I could tell you when I walked into a home and it was a Wi-Fi antenna because of the different sensations I got all, all over my body. I exposed myself to such a degree that I actually started to understand. I think it was actually Rob one time who told me that I'd become like a very expensive meter. I don't know if you remember saying that to me because I was so clear at identifying uh, what it was that was affecting me and when and where it was coming from. So back in the very beginning, I believe those who told me that it had no, no biological impact. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are feeling any of those symptoms on, on the board up there, but I really, 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 really encourage you not to take them for granted. Um, Magda calls them the rapid aging syndrome, and at 50 years old, I've been feeling young for a very, 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 very long time. And during the one and a half years to two years that it took me to recover, I felt like I was twice my age. I looked like I was twice my age, and I moved like I was twice my age. So don't assume that if your body seems to be breaking down, it's because you're getting older. We're far more resilient than the medical institutions <laughs> would have us believe. And uh, as a person who's now gone to the end and come back, I'm really clear what took me there. No one can tell me that I'm not feeling what I was feeling. I still feel it. I'm still sensitive, but I'm no longer sick, which, which is a, a real difference. Um, sorry, let's not train the thought there. Um, so I just really encourage you to pay attention. Uh, that there is some lists outside on the table for the Electrosensitive Society that gives you a list of precautions that you can take. They're not even really big precautions. They're simply habits that you can change that make a difference. And so I no longer have Wi-Fi in my house. I haven't had a microwave oven for about 20 years. Um, we have no cordless phone. We have Ethernet cable throughout. My daughter's not usually allowed to use her cell phone in our home. She has a cell phone that's a low SAR rating because I, I couldn't couldn't yet take that away from her. But there are different things that we can do that are degrees and steps to pull back from the technology that we are really, really addicted to. Okay, so after all of this information that you're being exposed to, which is far more than has been available, like that, than was available two years ago, you really have a choice in terms of what you believe. And I really encourage you to look just sort of deep down inside, if not just to common sense, and pay attention to what you're hearing before you have to pay dearly. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Veronica. Now, electro hypersensitivity. Are people really crazy if they claim to have all of these symptoms? Well, a lot of different organizations don't think so. This is the Canadian Human Rights Commission, and they recognize that electro hypersensitivity is an environmental sensitivity. So we have information from here. We know that the World Health Organization held a conference on electro hypersensitivity back in 2004, and all they, though they tried to change the name of it to idiopathic illness, which means we don't know what causes it, um, it hasn't stuck because it seems that 
Um, once you remove yourself from the radiation, you begin to recover. Whereas people who went to see their psychiatrist because their doctor thought it was a mental problem, they didn't recover. So it's a real physical illness. And the World Health Organization has a fact sheet on this. Electrohypersensitivity is recognized as an impairment in Sweden, and this is what Dr. Ola Johansson, who has been studying this for the past 30 years, said. Uh, Professor Ole Johansson in Sweden. Uh, in Sweden, impairments are viewed from the point of the environment. No human being is in itself impaired. There are instead shortcomings in the environment that cause the impairment. Thus, it is the environment that should be treated, not the person. So if you clean up your environment, your health improves. And it's the same thing with if we drink dirty water, if we drink contaminated water, we get sick. We have to take medication to stop the diarrhea. But if we continue drinking that dirty water, we continue to have the symptom. So the same thing with electromagnetic energy. We have to minimize our exposure in order to begin to recover. Now, there was a recent study that came out, and I really wanted to share this with you because I think it's probably one of the most important studies that has come out recently. This is a study where the scientists looked at seven different hormones in our body, and this is called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal complex, and we don't have to worry too much about what that means, except that these are the hormones that are responsible for your stress response, digestion, your immune system, emotions, sexuality, and your use of energy. Energy. And I'm going to walk you through this because I think the results are actually quite important. Um, here we have a study where we're looking at controls that are living 500 meters away from a cellular base station. Because our hormones change over time, in this particular study, there were younger people ages 14 to 22 and older people ages 25 to 60. And these are the seven hormones that they looked at. And although it's hard to read, picograms per milliliter is an incredibly small amount of hormone. So very small amounts of hormone changes in your body can have huge biological consequences. The other important thing to remember is that our hormone levels stay relatively constant. This is over a six-year period, and these are the averages for a group of, um, of um, younger people and then older people. So you can see we're dealing with something that's really quite stable. And these are the results for the first year. And here we're looking at two different distances. Uh, the orange is 20 to 100 meters from an antenna, and the blue is 100 to 500 meters, and that's compared to our control population. And I just have a little code there. H means it's higher than the control. L means the levels are lower, statistically significantly lower. And you can see there's a little bit of change here. In after three years, you can see that more of the hormones are affected, and after six years, all of the hormones are significantly lower uh, when these people are even up to 500 meters away from the antennas, except for prolactin. That was the only one that went up. And what happens if you have low testosterone? These are the symptoms that you're likely to experience. And the symptoms that I have in blue are similar to the symptoms people experience who are electrically hypersensitive. So if you have low testosterone, these are some of the symptoms that you're going to experience. If we, high, if we have high prolactin, these are the symptoms, and none of them correspond to electrical hypersensitivity. With low ACTH and cortisol, these are your stress hormones, and these are the symptoms. So the ones in blue, again, are the ones that people experience who have electrical hypersensitivity. Low T3 and T4, these are your thyroid hormones, and it means an underactive thyroid. And once again, we can see some of the symptoms that are similar. And your final one here is low progesterone, and you can see the symptoms that are similar to some of the ones that Veronica mentioned, and certainly the ones that we're finding in the studies. So here we have an example of changes in hormone levels that have been documented, which might be the mechanism responsible for some of the symptoms that these individuals are experiencing. 
Now, if you go to your medical doctor, you can get take progesterone and you can take testosterone. You can take all of those, or you can simply get rid of the, the, whatever's causing those low levels of hormones uh, and improve that way. So the question we started with, cellular antennas in your neighborhood, are they safe? And I guess my response to that is definitely not. They're really not safe. And whenever you say this, this to people, what they uh, say is, well, how do, you, how do you know? And, you know, if this were true, they would be telling us. This is the site on Google Map. This is the fire hall right here. And these are the various radiuses, 100, 200, 300, 400, and 500 meters within which the studies are telling us there could be biological effects. So for those of you who live within that, you've got some reason for concern. However, remember the antennas are sector antennas, and depending on which way they're facing and how powerful they are, it could be a very different population that's advert that could be exposed to this radiation and could experience some of the symptoms that Veronica experienced. Okay, if this was really unsafe, uh, and if this were true, they would have told us. Well, they are telling us. We have the World Health Organization telling us this is a possible uh, carcinogen. We have the US Air Force telling us it causes cancer in rats. We have the Interphone study telling us it causes brain tumors. We have three studies showing that it's actually associated with cancer if you live near them. We have five studies showing that it increases symptoms of electrical sensitivity. And we have another study showing us it affects our hormone levels. Scientists, when they get together, they're not very good at giving interviews because most people can't understand what they're talking about, uh, but they're very good at getting together privately and uh, setting up uh, resolutions and appeals. Since 2000, there have been 13 different uh, resolutions and appeals that scientists, doctors have um, uh, gotten together and asked that the guidelines internationally, which is very similar to our guidelines, be changed. The last one was in Norway in 2010, and you can see here the International Firefighters uh, Resolution back in 2004. For. So what I'd like to say is they are telling us. They really are telling us, and the problem is that we are not listening. Thank you very much.